Hi, this is Natalie. Thank you for listening to Crossroads Church, where we are bringing a real God to real people. I believe you'll be inspired by today's message. Good morning, Crossroads. How's everyone doing this morning? My name is Marcus. I'm the lead pastor here. Pastor Joel's in Kerrville. He'll be back, and uh, we'll continue our series. Right now, we began a series last week called Big Perspective. And so um, today, Pastor Joel talked about having proper perspective uh, about your future. So today we're taking a look at how to keep a perspective based upon your present circumstances. And so some of us, sometimes we face life, stuff happens, it's crazy, and sometimes we lose perspective. And so we're, we're looking at that this morning, and we're going to continue to look at that the rest of the year. Next week we'll look at um, how to keep pers- perspective, uh, not only in the future, not only in the present, but in your past as well. And then the last one is going to be about gratitude and how we can have gratitude in our lives to foster just a, a good, healthy uh, a way to manage your life. And so I encourage you to keep coming. But this morning, let's take a look at this. We just came back from, so before I start, all the vets here, man, I just respect you so much and thank you for your service. Uh, I, I love you guys. I pray for you guys all the time. I just came back from Guatemala this last week. Yeah, you can clap, give them give a hand. One of the things my wife and I do every year in um, on Veterans Day, we go out to Cracker Barrel or wherever, but usually Cracker Barrel, and uh, we buy our meal there, but we're always looking for a vet. And uh, so we buy their meal. Not only the vet's meal, but whoever they're with. A couple of years ago, there's like 10 of them in there. It's like, oh, shoot, but that's okay. <laughs> they're ordering a lot of food. But Natalie, you did that yesterday because I was out of the country, and uh, she got uh, a little older gentleman and bought his meal, and he, he was so appreciative, he just starts crying. He was he just He's a Vietnam vet war. And so I encourage you guys to go out there and just do something, just to honor them. Because we are in Guatemala, listen, man, I'm thankful I'm back on this soil. Kiss the ground. Because I saw a, a guy, a banker guy, taking his money to the bank and stuff on a motorcycle. But right behind him, not behind him, like on the seat, the same seat on his butt, he, had, he was riding with him with a big old shotgun. I'm like, oh, my God, what in the world? If you go to Burger King or Wendy's, there's a guy with a shotgun ready to beat you up if you order the wrong burger. Like, I don't know why they're there. I'm like, man, I'm going to go back home. <laughs> so um, anyways, but we are a blessed nation, and we are thankful to live in a place of freedom. I'm thankful I live in a city, Seguin, where the leadership of this city allows us to still go into the center of the city and speak the name of Jesus which we're going to be doing at Christmas Eve again. But we are here in a message to, we're talking about keeping the present in perspective. Little Johnny and his friends were out gallivanting around in the woods, and his friend found himself on the other side of the river. And he yells to Johnny, little Johnny, how do I get to the other side of the river? And little Johnny speaks up. He goes, you're already on the other side of the river. <laughs> thought that was cute. It's all about perspective. And so we're taking a look at that, and we're using a passage in 2 Corinthians, uh, the fourth chapter, as uh, our text this morning. If you, have, if you don't have notes, you can just uh, photo that QR code right behind you on the seat, and you can look at some of the notes that are there. There is a quote by John Milton that says, The mind has its own place. It can, it can make heaven out of hell and hell out of heaven. I mean, our mind is absolutely amazing. Uh, when I go to my uh, therapist or my psychologist, uh, he t- he's, he's helping me understand how the mind works. I'm like, man, it is absolutely incredible what our mind does every single day. But sometimes our mind, if we eat a lot and it's not sanctified, man, he'll take a little cut and it's bleeding. Next thing you know, man, I got to cut my finger off. I might have gangrene or whatever. I don't know. Just, they just over, they magnify the wrong things. Uh, that's what our mind does, and that's a tendency that our, our minds do. But in this text, 2 Corinthians 4, it says, For this light momentary affliction, how many of you guys are facing a very challenging time right now? One of y'all. So there is, so he, for that one, this, the overwhelming time, it's just the light momentary affliction, the Apostle Paul says. At that time when Paul was writing this, man, these guys were, I mean, some of them were getting killed, some of them were getting murdered. I mean, they were overwhelmed with per- persecution. And he goes, hey, this stuff that we're going through, it's just a light momentary affliction. In other words, it's temporary. And he goes, it, but it's preparing also. It's working. It's doing something. It's doing something eternal. But we just don't see it right now. Sometimes in life, we're going to have be just as thankful for the stuff that we think didn't go right with us as much as the stuff that we were blessed with and we thought went right for us because we're going to have a different perspective. 
But he goes, this momentary affliction, it's preparing for us an eternal weight of glory beyond all comparison as we look not to the things that are seen, but to the things that are unseen. Man, that's contrary to what humans do. We just focus and make decisions based upon what we see, what we hear, what we feel, and we, we go off on that. Now, there's something greater than that. Something else is going on behind the scenes as well. We don't look at and, and do those things just because of the things that we see, but we're also looking at the things that are unseen. The things that are seen, they're temporary, transient. They're subject to change, but the things that are not seen, they are eternal. Let me read the Message Bible. It says, we're not giving up. How could we, even though, the out, and even though on the outside it often looks like things are falling apart on us, on the inside where God is making new life, not a day goes by without his unfolding grace. These hard times that we face, they're just like small potatoes compared to the coming good times that are ahead. Notice this, he goes, the lavish celebration prepared for us. There's far more here in that situation that you're facing. There's far more here than meets the eye. The things we now see here today and gone tomorrow, but the things we can't see will last forever. So what do you do when you're overwhelmed with the present circumstance, when your, your circumstances outweigh the creed, when, when what you see in the Bible is not what you're experiencing in life? How, how do you handle? How do you, how do you focus? How do you get perspective in those overwhelming circumstances? Thank you for asking. One, it's temporary. Just remember that. It's subject to change. God can change things around in a millisecond. There's some things that need to be changed. There's some things he's going to empower you to go through the change or go through that stuff without any change. He goes, so, so what do you do with those things? Well, the scripture says that we need to do something called reframing. We have to have a different perspective on the situation that we're facing right now. Understand, one, it's temporary. Two, it's subject to change. But two, man, there's something going on behind the scenes as well. God's still working. So reframing throughout scripture is something, a principle we see over and over again. God for himself, he calls those things that are not as though they are. It says the chaos that this world began with, God was there in the beginning. He says even in the midst of the chaos, he, he spoke his word and all of a sudden it, it says he, he framed this world through his words. And you and I are imitators of him, and we have been empowered by his spirit to, you know, what you say really impacts your world around you, your own world and how you see what you're facing. And you can also, he's encouraged, this is not the message today, but you can also take the word of God and begin to speak God's word into your circumstance and just trust that his word is working mightily in the middle of all these things even though you don't see anything. Why? Because that's the fight of faith. It's the fight to remain in faith that the God of this Bible is the God that I'm serving. And so it contradicts the mind sometimes. But you, you're not here. You're not led by your mind. If you're led by the head, Fred, you'll soon be dead. You're led by God's spirit. He speaks to your spirit. And we have to understand that we have to be more God conscious than sin conscious. We have to be more God-centered than circumstance-centered. And that's the greatest fight I see as we're discipling folks, ministering to people. They're overwhelmed with the situation, and I am too. But listen, my emotion, all that stuff is real, but I can't live there. I know those things are subject to change. So I have to hold fast. What's the truth uh, behind this situation? And then find out what that is and just hold fast. Go to war with that. Go into my foxhole with that. And hold fast, not be moved by the stuff that's going on all around me. Does that make sense? The art of reframing. You see, uh, not only did, did, did God the Father do that in Scripture, it says by his words we were created, but David himself did that also. David didn't look at the size of the giant, the circumstance that he was facing. He looked at the size of his God. And he held fast to the size of, of who his God was. You uncircumcised Philistine, you don't have a covenant with him. I do. And so, therefore, he took action based upon that relationship with the Father. The art of reframing is most of the problems that we face in life is not circumstantial. They're perceptual. And we reduce God to the size of our greatest problem. That's what the children of Israel did. When they were out there to go spy out the land, they were overwhelmed with the giants. The giants 
of that land were so massive that their God became very, very small. Therefore, several million people were led astray into a wilderness because 12 leaders could not see, or 10 leaders could not see what God saw. Isn't that crazy? If you're in a leadership role, if you're leading your family, if you're a husband, you're leading your family, you're leading somebody. Everybody's leading something. How do you lead? And the people that are following you, what, 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 kind of, what are they producing? It's, it's kind of good to check that out every now and then. It'll help us, right? And if you're leading and no one's following, eh, I don't know, you're just taking a walk. But we're here to display the character and nature of our Heavenly Father, especially to our kids and our grandkids, to display whatever stuff happens in life. They, shouldn't be, they should see you be truthful and honest, but they should see you rise up from the ashes and still hold on to the strength by, by, by faith and, 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 and love God regardless of what you face, regardless of who you lose and how you lost them. Amen? Amen. They need to see your hurt. They need to see your pain. Your children need to see you fall but they need to see you rise back up again too in the power of his spirit. That's just what we do. That's what followers of Jesus do. We're not, we're not above anyone or elevated above anyone. Man, we are just here by grace and, and empowered by God's spirit to do the best we can to reflect and share this gospel to a hurting world. And if we stay that and keep that as our focus, we're going to do well in life and there's going to be fruit coming uh, in our life. But what do you do when you're overwhelmed and your mind you know, about the things or the stuff that's facing in life. How do you treat that? How do you focus on that? What do you do? How do you reframe that? <clears throat> it's fairly easy, and it's just not mind over matter, but you have to learn how to constantly look at things with a different perspective. I used to take my little girl, girl I had to put little girl down. He's a little toy poodle. And, um, um, but when I first got him, I said, I'm going to train this dog. And I felt kind of weird, like unmanly, because it's a toy poodle and have a leash, and I'm walking him down the hall, <laughs> down the street. And it was so frustrating, because I'm thinking, shepherd, I used to have, you know, Labradors and stuff, and it was fun with those dogs. We'd chase them, throw sticks, and Gur's like, he doesn't walk. He doesn't like walks. He likes sniffing. <laughs> we would go half a block, and he's still sniffing. It's like, man, what the heck? I'm going to take this dog back home. And so, so, actually, I still kept doing it. Why? Why did I keep doing it? Because I reframed it. It's like, hey, I'm going to take Gur for a walk. At first, I'd be like, eh, I don't want to take her for a walk. But now it's like, hey, I'm going to take Gur for a sniff. <laughs> and it, I just reframed it, and then I enjoyed it again <laughs> because that's what he was doing. And actually, the science behind it, the, 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 the dog sniffing stuff, it, it, it like fires him up. It's like he needs to do that. It's like exercising every morning or you going to your social media and doing all that stuff. It's like it, it, it does something inside of you. That's what dogs do. They need to do that. So don't take them for a walk. Take them for a sniff. <laughs> Change your perspective. That's the idea behind it, okay? I know it sounds weird, but that's the idea. So the first thing, if you're overwhelmed, the first thing we have to reframe is God. I don't know about you, but when I first came to Christ, the, the picture I had of my father was one who, who was heavy-handed, close-fisted. He would, he would punish me, and he would punish my family in different places because he needed to get our attention. We needed to go to church. We need to light a candle. We need to go do confession and all these things. And so, but that's not who my father is. So one of the first things that God had to do when I came to Christ was just descramble all that image I had. I had framed that picture. I had that picture in my frame. He had to help me reframe. And then when I reframed it, the picture changed. I began to see who God really is. And that's why Jesus came. Not only to redeem our life from destruction, but he came to tell the religious, leader, the religious, religious <laughs> leaders, that's not who my dad is. Quit representing him that way. You notice that he got really upset at those who were religious. Why? Because they were misrepresenting who his father was. And he does the same today. So the first thing we have to do is reframe God. What comes to mind when you think about God? What comes to mind? For some of us, Man, we have that image. And so, so you and I, we're not just the product of nurture and nature. You hear that a lot of time in philosophy or whatever. But we're a product of the God picture that's inside of us. Every single one of us. If I ask, what, do you, what comes to mind when you come to God, when you think about God? That answer 
really helps me locate anybody. I can tell you pretty much the future of that individual or where it's going towards anyways, the path that it's going towards. So one of the things we have to do is reframe who God is as far as your present circumstances because if you don't reframe that, you'll be blaming him for everything. You should have done this. You could have done this. You didn't do this. When you reframe who God is, you realize that sometimes God works immediate. Sometimes God works in seasons. Sometimes it just, he just does whatever God does. And our role is to abide in him, love him, trust him, believe in him, hold fast, and do it all in joy. Gosh, I hate that. <laughs> our flesh hates that. But, man, it's life to the person who yields to that. It really is. It, puts it, it sets them up for success in the future. Because we should not allow anything that this life brings affect who we are and what we think about him. That's good. Amen. <clears throat> we, we, we work from the inside out. What comes to mind? It's, it's a, you're, we're, we're a product of the God picture inside. So make the God picture inside large. Tozer, A.W. Tozer says, has a really great um, quote that says, a low view of God is the cause of a hundred evils. And that's what Israel did. They made God so small. They made the giants so large, their God became so small. And here's the truth, though. God's greater. God's bigger. God's larger. God's stronger. He's weightier. He's brighter. He's broader. He's wider. He's higher. He's he's bigger than all these things. And that picture needs to come. He is for you. He's not against you. He is for you. If he didn't withhold the very most precious uh, possession that he had was his own son, if he delivered him up for us, how shall he not also with him freely give us all things to enjoy? I mean, if he gave us his best, that's powerful. Now he wants to continue as, as, as those who are family members and called followers of Christ, man, he still wants to show, shower his love and his grace and his blessing upon you. Transform your total life so that you're strong on the inside. If you get stuff on the outside, great. Share it. You know, bless others with it. But if, all, if you're just poor the rest of your life, it doesn't matter. You're big on the inside. It doesn't stay steady in that because that's what really matters. Amen. And here's what's going to happen. For those that are bigger on the inside than on the outside, all of a sudden the outside's going to catch up. And you're going to see things happen that are, he's going to do t- for you because you've been obedient and faithful. And he can do it all in a millisecond. That's who God is. So, one, reframe God. Two, how do we reframe our circumstances? This is really what we're talking about. How do we reframe the current situation? Um, go back to your seat is the title of this message. And what does that mean? Well, we're, any, whenever we face stuff, we're sitting, we're in a season, whatever that is, we're sitting in this space. We're sitting in this space based upon life experience, based upon, you know, what's happening at work or just, just so many things. We're in a certain seat. We have a certain perspective. And so um, he wants to change and alter that perspective. I went to a concert a few years ago, uh, just, I don't know, three, four years ago. I went to go see Trans-Siberian Orchestra during the Christmas time. And uh, during that Christmas, I don't know if you've never done it, but I would encourage you guys to do it. It's absolutely beautiful. It's just, oh, it's just really a powerful little time and, and entertaining. And so my buddy uh, and I took my band of brother, went over there, and we were, we were sitting in a really good seat, like the lower section. I was, saw the band. I saw everything, the stage and all that. But what I didn't like was the people that were around me. It's not that I didn't know them, but they were just sweaty and smelly and loud and it was just, it just was not a, a fun time to be that of the first couple of songs. Like, man, I don't want to do this the rest of the night for two hours. And so, you know, I was a little frustrated. So I said, I'm going to go to the restroom. So I went to the restroom. On the way up to the restroom, there was a, I noticed a row of like three, three rows, you know, like three, three seats. The whole row um, was on the inside of the barrier. You couldn't cross the barrier. But this whole row all the way up to the restroom was empty. And I'm thinking, it's like, I looked and it's like, man, I can see the stage from there. I said, when I come back down, I'm going to sit right here. And so I did. Went to the restroom, came back down, sat there right in the middle section. Awesome view. Great perspective. I was like, man, this is it. I text my buddy. He's like, hey, come on up here. And he's a rule follower. He goes, no, I'm not going to do that. I'll stay right here. It's like, all right, you're going to smell. Anyways, <laughs> so I went up there and I'm like, 
And, and it, was, it was awesome because I could see all the band and the violin. I could see all the singers and all that. What the other cool thing was is on the left side, there was like a gap that I could see, that only the person on that seat could see, could see but I, I could see the, and anticipate what was next on the stage, because I could see the background. It's like, oh, man, this is what's going to come up, because they were already setting up and preparing. So it was a great perspective. And I'm sitting there just enjoying the moment, and then I get a tap on the shoulder. I'm like, oh, it's, like, yes, it's the usher. It's not usher, but the usher. It looked kind of like usher. And he goes, sir, he goes, you need to go back to your seat. I'm like, why? I said, man, all these seats are empty. He goes, because you have assigned seating. I said, but they're empty. He goes, go back to your seat. And I'm like, I couldn't take them on. I couldn't take them anyway, so I went back to my seat. And so I went over there with uh, my buddy, and we were hanging out there, and I was frustrated again. And so we're sitting there, and I'm looking back up. I didn't see anybody there in those seats, and I didn't see that usher. He left somewhere. I don't know where he went. I said, I don't, that guy don't know me. I'm going to go sit, sit back up there. And so I went back up there, and I got to enjoy the rest of the concert up there. And I it had a different perspective. And it, was, it was awesome. And so sometimes, here, here's my point. And my point is this. is like sometimes in life, you do get assigned a seat. You, you, you get a, you're in a situation that you can't prevent. And you're, you have an assigned seat that's confining you and restricting you. And, you know, it's just, it's just hard in that moment. And sometimes you're supposed to sit in that seat. And stay in that seat and allow God's grace to be poured into you so that you can overcome whatever it is that you're facing in the middle of that circumstance, in the middle of that uncomfortable seating. Make sense? It's grace to help us, to build us up, make us stronger. But there are other times that we allow other people, tickets, things that that they're producing that are trying to confine us to the seat, to stay in the seat. And to restrict us from an experience that we could have. And so you have to discern whether I'm supposed to, am I assigned to do that or I'm assigned to get out of that place and, and look for a better seat. Well, God has a better seat for us. He has assigned seating for every single one of us who have crossed over the line of faith. It's called sitting in heavenly places in Christ Jesus. Amen. And what that means is this, is that you and I positionally, not physically, but positionally in the spirit, it says that Jesus not only died, he was buried, but he was raised from the dead, and he is what? Sitting, his seat is at the right hand of the Father, which is the place of authority. And Jesus is called the head of the church, right? The head of the church is at the right hand of power and authority, over dominion, dominion over all. But I don't know about you, I've never seen a person with just a head moving. There's no one in this room that just has a head and no body. It'd be a weird church, a head church. So, so everyone here has an attached body to their head, correct? Well, the same is true with Jesus. Jesus also has a body that's attached to his head. And you and I are that body. We are the body of Christ. So what I'm saying spiritually and positionally and scripturally is that when Jesus died, we died with him. When he was buried, we were buried with him in baptism. When, we, when he was raised, we were raised with him also. But when he sat, we also sat with him as the body. So not only is Jesus in that place of authority, we're in that place of authority as well. And it's out of that place that we do life. In the power of his grace, in the power of his spirit, and, and, and we look at life from that perspective, from that seat, that assigned seating that he's given us. I don't know how many times have I been overwhelmed and making dumb decisions that I hear him say, go back to your seat. I'm like, oh yeah, I forgot about that. And so I take a trip and I go to my assigned seating where Jesus is. And it's in that place I look at Marcus Oh, poor little Marcus. Man, he's making stupid decisions. And he's a pastor. And then all of a sudden, from this perspective, I can see, one, the foolish things I'm saying or doing, and then I can also see the pathway he wants me to go, or the, 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 the what do you call it, the, the change, the shift that I need to make. Marcus, yeah, I know, I know, I know. I need to forgive Natalie, I know. I need to confront this person. Yes, I know. I need to let go of this person. 
I need to send this to the missionary, or I need to, whatever it is, I see myself. It becomes so clear. And so I would encourage you, even though it feels like maybe it's just a story or something, it's true, it's reality, it's really who, what, 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 we, what we contend with. We have to fight to, to get in this place and see ourselves from this place, from this place of strength, from this place of power, because a lot of times we're making decisions out of a place of weakness, out of a place, what I call yellow light or red light. Whenever I would go into a, a batter's box, I would always just put one foot in that box. I wouldn't go in with full force. Why? I learned. I don't know who I learned. I'd learned it for myself because this is what I had to do mentally. Red light, that picture is going to strike me out. I wouldn't, I wouldn't step in because the picture was good. One time we were fixing to play a, a Nationals game, and uh, the pitcher hadn't showed up yet. Well, all of a sudden, we hear a helicopter. This helicopter comes down on the field, and the pitcher walks out. I'm like, are you kidding me? And they, man, they were just like, so I'm up to bat. I was like, man, there's no way. He says, this guy, so that's red light. I don't go in, uh, into, I can't go into a place in confidence if I'm in a red light or I'm in a yellow light. I'm just going to guess what to do. Flip, throw a coin. But when I'm in green light, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm in alignment. I'm loving my wife. This is what Natalie and I do. When, when stuff is happening that's crazy, one, we look at our love walk. Am I, am I in willful rebellion against my father? No. Check. I'm good. Am I, am I have discontentment with my spouse? No. Check. We're good. Uh, if, if we're not good, hey, make amends. Take care of that. And then I'm in a good place, in a good place of authority of confidence. And then I look at my kids. Then I look at you guys. Is there anybody here that I've offended, that I, that I know about, that I need to make amends? And I, and I go up to them and I just say, hey, hey I want to talk. Because I need to make sure that I'm clean. Not clean like holy clean. Marcus is awesome. It's like I, I just need to check myself constantly. How, how can I expect God's blessing and I'm asking for his blessing upon you guys in this church when I'm not being obedient to what he's asking me to do here? I, have no, I can't have any faith to do that. I can't ask God, Lord, make provision abound when I don't even give, I don't even serve and give tithes or give alms or offerings or, you know, or in obedient whenever he's asking me to give and bless others. When, when I'm closed fisted and I'm asking him to be open handed, it doesn't make any sense. There's no faith in that. Can't do that. You can do that. And a lot of people live that way, but that's not wholesome. That's not godly living. That's not how we do this. And we're not here to make, we're not exchanging things with God. He's Lord. This is not a democracy where we vote. We, we have a king, he speaks, we obey. Amen. That's how you conduct our life. And that, that little decision right there can make total change in your whole family. Now, here's a beautiful thing is that even though you yield yourself to that, we know we're going to fail. We know we're going to mess up. But our heart is to serve him wholly, is to follow him wholly. And when we mess up, we get back up. And it's important for our kids to see that too, Right? And so you have to reframe the circumstance that you're, you're finding yourself in by taking that trip and get into your seat and look at yourself from that situation. Sometimes you can do it as a couple. It's like, hey, this is what we're doing. This is what we're facing. Look what we're, look what we're doing. But if we get to our seats, it's like, oh, this is what we probably should be doing. You, it becomes a little bit clearer. Just watch. Just try it. Now, here's what happens a lot of times in, in my life. First, it's just experience, but it's scriptural too. Uh, when I'm in that seat of authority and I'm in that space, I usually receive one of two things. Uh, there's several things that happen in life that I've gotten instruction. I mean, the answer to a thousand and one questions is how to be, is be led by God's spirit. Get, to, get close to him so that you can hear him and you, you, you conduct yourselves in that way. And I'm not talking about just hearing voices. I'm talking about aligning yourself with God's word. This is his voice. This is his voice. This is his word. This is his letter written for us. We have more instruction here. You know, most of us are just fat Christians. Most of us just need to just start doing what we already know to do before we get God's plan for everything. We just need to obey, Right? And so, but when, when I get to that place, usually because I'm in a mountain situation, so one of two things he asks me to do to the mountain, either I speak to the mountain, I am in my place of authority, I speak to the mountain, Mark 11, 23, 24, be thou removed, 
It has to obey me. And I just speak. I will walk in my authority and speak that. Because if I've checked all these things, I'm in a place of authority. And if I'm in a place of authority, I have the, the, the unction or the anointing, the grace to say no to the devil, to rebuke the devil, to, you know, to, to tell them to do whatever, whatever I need to do. <clears throat> uh, he either says, speak to that mountain, or he says, shout grace to that mountain, according to Zechariah. In other words, he says, I'm not going to move that mountain, but I'm going to empower you with my grace so that you can walk through that mountain. And so you'll have to find out what that is, but you'll never find out if you're not seeking him. But I see that over and over in my life, that either he's asking me to speak and take authority in that moment, or he's asking me, hey, receive my grace. It's like the Apostle Paul, take this from me. No, my grace is sufficient. In your weakness, I am strong. What is grace? Grace is God's ability to do what you can't do in and of yourself. We live a supernatural life. It takes supernatural strength on the inside for us to forgive people, to, to, to look at, you know, to, to let God be our defense rather than voice our opinions on social media. I mean, there's so many things. Walking in God's strength has a lot to do with constraint than anything else. Restraining yourself from doing what your flesh wants to do. And only by God's grace will he allow us to do those things. So speak grace or... Uh, take authority. Now, example, I've been going through 17 years, circumstance in my life. I got three daughters. My oldest one, you guys, some of you guys know, you know, I've, I've str we've struggled with her. She's just like her dad. Addictive behavior, you know, just making foolish decisions. But this is the girl that God used to lead us to Christ. You know, when I, whenever I was, Natalie was having my second child, a little Baptist girl led Aaron to Christ at three years old, and, and Aaron got that Bible that they gave her and gave it to Natalie, and Natalie started reading the scripture and opened up the door for us to, to start having a Bible study with someone, and then God came in. She tricked me into having a Bible study, and so when that took place, I got to open up my Bible, and then God supernaturally just absolutely changed our whole life in a millisecond on a Saturday morning. But it was through my daughter that that happened. So I'm raising her. I'm loving her. I'm, man, just proud of her. Going out to dates with her as a little child. She's just a beautiful soul. But she's been struggling. She's got some mental issues and just addiction issues. So for 17 years, we've been praying. God, man, supernaturally grace her. Love on her. Deliver her. And, uh, just been holding fast to the word of God. How do you do that? Reframing. In other words, one day the spirit of God, because I was overwhelmed. I said, Lord, I don't understand this. I, I just don't get it. And so he, you remember the story, Jairus? I said, yes, sir. Jairus comes on behalf of that little girl, his daughter, because she was really sick. He goes, Jesus, come and lay your hands on her. I know that you can heal her. He's a, he's a, he's a ruler of the synagogue. And Jesus went, goes with him. Well, on the path, he gets interrupted by the woman with the issue of blood, Mark chapter 5. And the woman with the issue of blood, she begins to minister to him, and she gets healed and delivered. And then all of a sudden, that little delay of time, the folks come in from his house. He goes, hey, she didn't make it. She's dead. I mean, he could have easily gotten angry and had a stuff in the pit of his stomach and just shamed that woman. He, couldn't, he, he could have not rejoiced with her because she interrupted him. And that time could, you could have been to, to go and see my daughter. So he was, in that moment, she's dead. And Jesus immediately spoke his word. He goes, do not be afraid, only believe. And so they walk to the house. When they get to the house, again, they're screaming, they're yelling, they're, you know, giving all their craziness. And she's dead, she's not gonna, she didn't make it, and what have you. So Jesus takes them all out of the house. Only him and a couple of his disciples and the mom and dad. And he goes into that room. And he goes, she's not dead. She's only sleeping. He says, little girl, I say to you, rise up. He said, Marcus, every time you see your daughter, he says, it's not only your daughter, it's my daughter. Every time you see her, you speak that. She's only sleeping. Little girl, I say to you, rise up. That's been, so every time I see my little Aaron, I don't see her as an addict. 
I don't see her as a mental health picture. I've reframed it. I see her as a little girl who's asleep right now, but she will rise again. That's my hope for the future. That's how I press in to those circumstances that are overwhelming. Only through God's word and God's spirit can we do this. Does that make sense? There's an old, old song that we used to sing. Uh, Some of you guys, old guys, (laughs) know it. Just turn your eyes upon Jesus. Look full in his what? His wonderful face. And the things of this earth, it says look full in his wonderful face. And the things of this earth will grow strangely dim in the light of his glory and grace. So what do I do with all this stuff? Well, here's your take home. What are the odds right now? You're facing stuff. It's like, man, they're overwhelming odds. I need a miracle. Well, God does his best work when you're at your worst state. Does it over and over again. So I really want to encourage you to go because adversity is always the seed of an opportunity. Always. I learned that from my pastor. When, when hurricanes come and tornadoes come, like big city or country stuff comes, you know, I say, Marcus, just watch. Here's an opportunity for the gospel right now. So I've learned, I've trained myself. When the stuff is the worst, there's an opportunity somewhere. I just got to find that entrance. Goes, so, so in that moment, you have to reframe and go back to your seat. And then in that seat, you have to find out, what am I supposed to do, Lord? How am I supposed to speak? How am I supposed to treat that situation? So this morning, I just want to encourage you to take some time this week and just really go to this simple exercise. I think what will happen, you'll be revealed on what you should be doing. Maybe the adjustment that you need to make or how, you want, how he wants you to hold fast to, this se- to him in this season of life. Amen. If you are ever in the Seguin area, come visit us on Sunday mornings at 9 or 11 a.m. Or you can just download our app and receive our weekly messages right to your phone. Just text CC Seguin to 77977 and click on the link that you receive. May the remainder of your week be enriched with God's favor and blessings.